If you're looking for the next best thing to invest in, try investing in your long-term health with Forward. Forward is intelligent medicine with a personal touch. Their doctors are dedicated to catching top killers like cancer and heart disease early, which could save you tens of thousands of dollars in the long run. So invest in a doctor that's invested in you. Visit GoForward.com to learn more about how Forward can help you manage your long-term health risks for one flat monthly fee. That's GoForward.com. Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby! And I am Liv, here with some bonus content. Because, well, Medusa. The further I got into this podcast, and it's been three years now, but the further I got into it and into the mythology itself, the more fascinated I became with Medusa. I always was, to an extent, but the thing that's really been eye-opening for me over the past year or so is the reception to Medusa on the internet. It's unlike any other character from Greek mythology and centers deeply around really toxic masculinity and fragility when it comes to, primarily, cisgendered men on the internet. It's dark as hell. So the episode you're about to listen to is a conversation, a very fun conversation that's not at all dark, that I had with Anwen Kaya Hayward, a woman who I've become friends with through Twitter, um, stemming from, you guessed it, men and their comments about Medusa on Twitter. Anwen is a bit of an expert on Medusa. She was doing her PhD on the woman and has written a really lovely novella all about her and sort of a more um, sympathetic take on her that I would highly recommend and you can find a link to it in the, the episode description today. She and I had this conversation a while ago now, a couple of months. It got delayed because I was waiting on this source book, uh, which, thank the gods, has so many more sources on Medusa than I've ever been able to find before. But since we had this conversation, a few things have changed. One, I had to cut out references to a former male ally, that's in quotations, because just days after she and I discussed Medusa and how this man on Twitter, who we both knew fairly well, uh, rallied the troops in support of women's voices, he was outed as an enormous creep and faced a Me Too reckoning of his own. Because of course that happened. And two, uh, multiple more instances of dudes freaking out about Medusa on Twitter have happened to us since this recording. It's truly baffling and really disheartening when it comes to men. <laughs> I know I have a lot of cis dude listeners, and so I do want to say thank you for not being those guys. And when it comes to the responses to tweets about Medusa on the internet, I want to bring up a couple specific anecdotes that are often replied that I just find particularly troubling. Replies to tweets about Medusa defending herself, with people saying that she deserved to die or that it was a release of some kind for her to die. Those are not factually anything. What they are are weird misogynist takes. There's no evidence that Medusa needed to die, that she welcomed death or anything of the sort, that it helped anything in any kind of way. And yet it's an argument that I've been hearing a lot. But why is it that Medusa welcomed death, apparently, but say the Minotaur didn't? Why is it that the woman's death is cathartic in a way that this man monsters is not? If you're at all curious about some of these conversations that have been had on Twitter, I'm including a link to a thread in the description of today's episode. I think that some of the replies are interesting to look at and sort of wrap your head around the mentality that comes with this character. Anyway, it's messy as hell talking Medusa on Twitter, but you're damn right I'm going to keep doing it. Like I said, Anwen is the author of a novella on the snaky woman herself, 
It's called Here the World Entire. She has studied her quite extensively. We also just get along very well on Twitter and it was incredibly fun to talk to her. This is a really fun, very casual conversation all about Medusa, uh, Greek mythology, but primarily our experiences as women on Twitter talking about those things. You can find a link to Anwen's Twitter and her book in the description of today's episode. She's also just generally fun and really loves the 1999 movie The Mummy, something I identify with deeply and which she talks about on Twitter a lot. Highly recommend the follow. This is A Conversation on Medusa and Male Fragility with Anwen Kaya Hayward. So why don't you introduce yourself? We're talking today about Medusa, and so tell me a little bit about you. Hi, I'm Anwin. Um, I am somebody who is a huge fan of Medusa, so much so that I decided it would be a good idea to write a book uh, retelling her myth from her perspective. So I did that, and then I attempted a PhD on the similar topic. Uh, PhD life wasn't really for me, as it turns out. Uh, but I I absorbed all the Medusa information and now I'm just kind of like, you know, the Infinity Stones in Marvel where they have all this energy that they just like need to kind of emit. That's what I'm like, but with Medusa information. I absolutely love that and I get it completely. I should say I also just finished your book, um, oh, which you. was really lovely. It's I'm going to try. I'm going to miss a word from the title. Is it the just the world entire or is it here the world entire? Yeah, it's here the world entire, here which the world is entire. a very strange title. I don't know. Oh, why I love I... the title. Thank you. I absolutely love the title. Um, but it was really fascinating. I did. I loved what you did with with that story. So I definitely I think we should talk about that at some point, too, especially so you can just hype yourself up. Um, but a peek behind the curtain of this is you and I are uh, Twitter friends, I would say. And yeah, yeah, and it kind of came about because both of us are, have encountered a lot of um, angry men on the internet with regards to Medusa quite specifically. And so so we, yeah, (laughs) it just happens constantly. Yeah. I mean, literally this last week, like, have you been following my like what's going on (laughs) yeah exactly it happened again it's so bizarre and I think I I mean I think it needs to be discussed or certainly I want to because uh you know angry men on the internet are kind of everything about my life with this podcast so what what do you think (laughs) what do you think it is about Medusa that causes this all the time so I have a couple of theories and actually Um, I was kind of on the phone to my sister this week and I was just like walking home from work and like ranting at her and kind of trying to work out in my mind what was going on. And I was kind of saying, I think part of it is because these particular men who do get really irate about the myth, I think they sort of see that women have kind of carved a space into this typically male sort of patriarchal field of study and they just don't like it. Like, they cannot stand that women have kind of taken this uh, recognisable myth and they've said, you know what, this is really ripe for, like, really great productive feminist reception. And, I mean, it is. It's a great myth to talk about, you know, a whole range of feminist issues like uh, internalised misogyny, stigma, sexual abuse. I mean, the Me Too movement is quite often used as a kind of metonym for that. And, yeah, I, I think a lot of men just really don't like it. Yeah, I think that's absolutely it. And I think it's it's one of those things, I mean, Greek mythology in general uh, attracts a lot of great people and it attracts a lot of mm. not great people. Um, yeah. I mean, that that's like Greek and Roman history as a whole, I would say, has that. Obviously, there's this the huge surge of, of white supremacist movements that take hold of that as well, yeah. which is, yeah, its own whole horrible issue. Um But I think Medusa, yeah, I think people love, this has certainly been my experience and I think absolutely yours as well, if not necessarily all of it, but people love to point out when you're referring to a so-called different version of the myth or a so-called unoriginal version, which of course is a very problematic statement because 
there is no original anything in Greek mythology. There's just the things we have that have survived. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it always ends up being, if you talk about Ovid's take on Medusa, mm-hmm. which is, it is his version, but at the same time, it's not like he just made up everything to do with that. It's just that he, no. yeah, I mean, and he wrote it down in a beautiful way that I think people take hold of because obviously depending upon the translation, but I mean, personally, I absolutely love Metamorphoses oh, I know. and the way he tells the story and most of the women in it, I think, I mean, it's some of the best women in Greek mythology and the way that they're treated is it's it's a bit more honest in terms of the trauma that goes along with being a woman in that world. And most other sources don't touch on that at all. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I think that you've kind of tapped in there to a really big part of why when we talk about Medusa kind of in 2020, we almost inevitably talk about the Ovid version. You know, we do. And it's not because we're all we're all idiots who think it's like the only version of the myth it's because it's the version of the myth that i think lends itself most easily to as a vehicle for interpretation and not just interpretation but like multi-layered interpretation i mean i feel like i i don't want to talk about it but i kind of have to uh freud had lots to say about that version of the medusa myth and I, I hate everything he said. It makes me just, you know, want to throw up. But there's a reason that he chose kind of that depiction of Medusa for his kind of thesis of like male castration and like fear of women. And and I think similarly, Ew. I know, I know, just don't read for I, I'm not familiar with it. And I think I'm okay with that. I mean, um, but <laughs> ew. All I can really say about the Freudian version um, I don't want to like disturb you too much, but <laughs> he has this big idea that like the head of the gorgon with the snakes around um, the skull is supposed to represent like quote unquote female genitalia. Oh, so that's lit. I I know. So that's literally kind of like <laughs> the extent of his mythical analysis is like oh snakes could be pubes. Oh sure, yeah, that checks out. I mean, it's so similar. Yeah. I I have. I take such issue and I have not researched it. So, you know, this is not to say I really know anything about Freud, but I take such issue with the Oedipal complex because. Oh my God. Yeah. (laughs) Oedipus didn't know. And like, there's just. He didn't know. He didn't know. And there's no way for you to convince me that there's even like a subset of him, a part of him, an inner monologue within him that knew. He simply did not know. No. Jocasta did not know. That is the story. It's literally the entire crux of the story. Like that, that is the narrative. <laughs> Exactly. Like, you can't just say, like, no, no, subconsciously he knew. It's like, no, he did not, yeah. because there was absolutely no hint whatsoever, except, you know, that he killed the guy who was pretty clearly the king on the road. But if you, <laughs> like, even still, you wouldn't know that you're the son of this woman. I think he should have known that he killed the king, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and I think that's a big issue, actually, with a, a lot of, um, in particular, Freud, but actually kind of in general the sort of turn of the century very hyper masculine analyses of the medusa myth is that they're so incredibly a reductive and b just based on this kind of bizarre misreading or partial reading of the actual narrative i mean you look at for example yeah. like i mean i think we'll talk about this probably a bit more later but this past week i've got into like an article war with uh, <laughs> yes <laughs> i haven't followed every every article i started reading or oh, i yeah. read a good portion of your first response and then kept seeing that there was more and i was like i don't know if i can do this <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible i i can't like express the extent to which his uh analysis insofar as there was an analysis was just um a like reductive and be offensive but um, the kind of crux of his thesis, and again, insofar as there was a thesis, because the thread of his article was very hard to follow. But he was first. Sorry, let, no, I'm just going to add a little bit of explanation about this. Oh yeah, sorry. You know, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. No, it's fine. So essentially, uh, this is in reference to. Um, I'm always going to forget the artist's name, but the Medusa holding the head of of Perseus. Yeah, Luciano. Cavatti. There we go. And it, you know that it that statue sort of goes viral every few months I would say yeah. um 
always kind of yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, it happens a lot always as if it's this brand new thing um but essentially right now it it is being displayed before a courthouse in new york and so it's a much bigger deal and people are writing things about it uh which is where this man's article begins it was just awful i mean yeah it was basically just him writing sort of two thousand words of complete tripe about how uh, the statue was wrong because it wasn't how the myth actually went and interpreting myth differently to, and I'm using a quote here, the original version <laughs> is, it gets worse, is millennial narcissism. <gasps> Which is oh hilarious. good, you have to bring millennials in, yeah, don't you? Yeah. Oh I mean, gosh. like, when you think about mythic interpretation, the first thing you think of isn't like Aeschylus, Plato, Ovid, it's millennials. <sighs> That's so, <laughs> so gross. And of course, I think, I mean, we're both, I think, deep millennials. Um, and it, I mean, the millennial stuff gets me all the time anyway. Like anyone using millennial as this kind of derogatory, nonsensical mm. term often used to describe people who are not millennials and are considerably younger. Um, it's just always nonsensical. And this, it's sort of like people just want to use it as, as a the trump card i hate using that word now but uh i know it's like it's a ruined word um yeah of just like well this is how you win an argument is like well the millennials are at fault in some way or somehow and yeah the idea that oh my gosh the original myth so uh, do we know what what version he was referring to as so-called original was it hesiod i think it was meant to be hesiod which as you will know, is kind of hilarious because the Hesiod version of the myth is the myth that I would say uh, Ovid draws most clearly on for his version Absolutely. of Metamorphoses. So Also, the Hesiod version of the myth is is brief. <laughs> it's like three lines, if that. Yeah. Like, does Hesiod even get into Perseus or does he just talk about her fate? I think it's I feel like just, just her fate. I mean, I don't want to say that as a definitive fact, but from what I can recall, it's pretty much just like, this is how the world began Medusa was there, Poseidon did something quite nasty, and then there were monsters that came out of her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and she suffered a woeful fate, I think is the translation I've seen often. Yeah, and I think that's like literally it, like that's all we hear. We don't hear what her fate actually is, we just hear that it was like, as you say, woeful. Yeah, it was a bad, a bad thing that happened. And well, and Hesiod is is such a problematic figure in general. I mean, obviously, he's one of the only sources we have that are that old and that talked about myths more broadly and not just, you know, Homeric stories. Um, but at the same time, he was like notoriously misogynistic and all of his interpretations should be understood with a like the lens through the lens of this man did not like women so maybe let's interpret it accordingly yeah and, and i think also as as well as that like through the lens of this man did not create these myths like these are mm -hmm. not original stories that he had just sat down one evening in front of a roaring <laughs> fire and committed to paper do you know what i mean like he's drawing on existing oral traditions and not just from the local area that he lives in but from all over his kind of cultural experience and I think that what a lot of people like I won't name him just to be polite but like the man who wrote the article I responded to they make the mistake of thinking that because this is the oldest extant version of the myth that is synonymous with this is the oldest version of the myth and that's just yeah factually incorrect it's nonsense and it's one of those things I mean this is something I encounter all the time in every story I tell, which is, you know, the varied versions of everything that we have, you know, questioning what existed before those versions were written down or what versions we lost through time, what weren't copied over and over again so that we have them and and things like that. And then at the same time, the people who would write them down and the people whose works would then get copied. Um, I make a lot of comments about how the stories we have were written down by men and so yeah. we should understand them accordingly. And I've had people try to call me on that, you know, as if they're right. <laughs> um, but it was things like, well, no, women clearly told the stories to their children. So clearly women had an influence in all of that. And therefore that's all wrong. And, and I mean, I'm sure women told stories to their children and I'm sure they were different from what we have, but in order for something to be 
uh, for, for it to have reached us, it had to have been copied over and over and over again. And they didn't copy the work of women over and over and over again. I mean, there's a reason we only have fragments of Sappho. Yeah. It, it's it's one of those things of, you know, we the things we have from from ancient Greece are are based around the opinions of men and that's not to say that that's what existed only back then it's what we have now well exactly and and that's yeah that's it isn't it is that when you say that the corpus of literature that we have is very male dominated or uh, is kind of written through the lens of male experience and male values you're not saying hey ancient greek women were entirely passive figures in their lives and didn't tell stories what you're saying is that the stories that were preserved for us to read were preserved for a reason. Yeah, <laughs> because of the patriarchy. Um. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. And, and I think um, it's kind of like if you look at, for example, other versions of the stories that we know existed and were contemporaneous but weren't copied down. So like we know, uh, just as a kind of random example, the version of the uh, Persephone myth as told as part of the rite of initiation for the Eleusinian mysteries, that wasn't written down because it was a secret mystery cult. Does that mean that they didn't have their own version of the myth? Nope. It just means that we have no idea what it was. That's fascinating. And also those things hurt so bad. (laughs) I know. Like, what were they? We'll never know. It's one of those things, like, there's... uh, It's what I think about, I think, a huge portion of my life is sort of what I wouldn't give to know the stuff that we've lost. Oh my god! Okay. Right? It, it, I mean, I would give anything to go back there. It, it would be awful because I'm a woman. Um, <laughs> pretty horrifying. Um, but at the same time, it's like, oh, the things that we don't have, even just plays alone. I was thinking literally the other day about um, the Myrmidon trilogy, <laughs> trilogy right? and I was like, I would give my left arm and my right leg to be able to read that and to see it staged. Yeah. Like it would be. And we have like four lines from the whole trilogy. It's so upsetting. I would give anything to have to watch Medea be actually staged. I mean, obviously we have that, but I just the the Deus Ex Machina of Medea. I want to see in the ancient times. So yeah. Badly. Oh my god! How would they even do that? They had the whole machine to like a machine to raise her over the stage on a dragon oh. chariot. Ah, <laughs> uh. that would be so good. It would just be incredible. It would be amazing. And I think Medea actually is a, is a kind of really good example of another myth that men really don't like when you talk about. Yeah, it's and it's one another one where I think you can read a lot of different things and people have a lot of different opinions about whether Euripides was pro or against mm. Medea and therefore kind of women. I'm on the side of pro, at least with the good translations I've read. I think it's an incredible interpretation and absolutely love Euripides for it. No, I, I mean, I would I would agree. Like one of the projects that I've been working on for about a year at this point, I'm writing a retelling of the Medea myth as told by Euripides, because I think that it's one of the examples oh. of like ancient Greek narratives about women where the female character, okay, I'm not going to like, <laughs> I'm not going to make excuses. She does some bad things. But she, yes, definitely. <laughs> but she has actual agency. Like, okay, she yeah. does some less than desirable things with that agency, but she's not just a kind of passive figure viewing this narrative of men. And I think that that in itself is really fascinating. Absolutely, yeah. She's a real full fledged character. She's fleshed out. She's got things. She's just she's a real person in a way that I think doesn't exist much. And I would say usually in terms of the plays it is in plays by Euripides. I mean it helps that we have the most by him. Yeah. Um but still, you know, I I just think of Electra too, like his Electra versus the other oh, Yeah, it's just more interesting because I actually wrote mm-hmm. uh, wrote my master's thesis about the uh, House of Atreus, so I wrote about um uh, it was it was an interesting time. I got to read all the different plays by all of the tragedians that were st- survive, uh, and I just prefer his version. Like I hated reading the other ones; it was just boring.
But Medusa, I think, I do think it's something I want to dive even deeper into this sort of idea of men on the internet and her because it's it's happened to both of us a lot. Yeah, there is that. Yeah, the sort of anger at that statue, which I think is so interesting, and certainly the article that was first written that you responded to, the mm. idea of of saying that something is sort of bad because it's not the truth, like the true myth, yeah, the so-called true myth, is so nonsense. Anyway, it's like, I mean, that's what art is, sir? <laughs> yeah, and, and I think ultimately I'm very much in favor of myth being interpreted how you want to interpret it, because I think that the key part of what makes myth myth, in my opinion, is that it is inherently malleable, it's changeable, it's fluid, and you can read kind of whatever you want into it because myth is such a good paradigm for you to make sense of the world as you experience it. But I think the flip side to that is that you need to be very aware of why you choose to interpret a myth a certain way. And I think you need to interrogate your internal biases and why you see what you see in that narrative. So, I mean, for example, when I read uh, the Ovid version of the myth of Medusa, I see it very much as being an example of a woman who is raped. She is victim blamed by another woman, Athena. Uh, She lives her life completely in solitude. She can't look at anyone, which for me is a really good analogy for trauma. And I view the myth in that way because of my own experiences as a woman. But then the man who wrote this article, he viewed it as an example of a myth about you know, a hero. And Perseus is is the main character in the myth as he sees it. And Medusa stands only as an example of, and again, I'm, I'm quoting, toxic femininity. I, I, I wanted to like vomit. But this man sees Medusa, A, not as a rape victim, because he specifically said in his article, I don't believe that a god can rape, therefore Medusa is not a rape victim. Oh my god. Yeah, I mean, we we haven't got time to unpack all of that. But he then also said that he views Medusa and Andromeda as kind of like two sides of femininity, where Medusa has to be decapitated in order to recover from her trauma so that Perseus can save Andromeda. I'm not even kidding. That is literally what he said. (laughs) And I think... Like, I again, I'm in favor of people reading what they want to read into a myth. But I think that men who view this myth in that particular way need to ask why that's how they view it. I mean, why was this man so keen, for example, to deny Medusa's experience as a rape victim? Why was he so keen to insist that she has to be decapitated? Like, there are reasons for why that was his perception. Yeah, that I mean, that is that's something else entirely. The whole thing. I mean, I'm so interested to hear what translation he was reading, for one, um, because mm. the translation I use uses the word rape. I don't know if it uses it in the story of Medusa, but he uses it mm. in a lot of Ovid's retellings, which I appreciate. Um, yeah. But I mean, that's disgusting in general and makes me afraid of him like as a person that's it yeah I mean I I actually showed his article to a few like female friends and they all genuinely said the same thing and that was this scares me like this is actively kind of a terrifying view to have of a myth that that is as you say about someone being raped whether or not you want to cast her as like a monster or a rape victim or however you want to cast her the fact of her rape is there in the narrative it's in the text it's not open to interpretation that's one of the few things that we can say in this version of the myth she is raped absolutely i mean i think yeah, the ovid one is it's explicit it's not yeah it's not it's not up to to somebody's understanding of it um he see it sure <laughs> that's its own problem that's an argument that, that I think ultimately, I think me and you feel the same way about it, which is that we feel that it's quite clear that it, there's not consent in that scenario. But I, I think that there is more of a kind of like blurred boundary where you can kind of get in there and argue against that. But with Ovid, it's it's not a boundary. It's like a box. You can't get in. Like it's, it is rape. Yeah. Ovid understood it to be. Absolutely. I think the problem with Hesiod is that I don't think 
he respected women enough to understand that as a concept. Yeah. Um, and then so I think it's open to interpretation based on everything else. But Ovid understood it. He talks mm. about it extensively in Metamorphoses, and he makes it very clear in that story that that's what's happening. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that people or men, I should say, on the internet uh, are just so, uh, so worked up about that story completely. I mean, ev- she goes viral so often. It's it's kind of a fascinating thing. I, I talked to somebody else, I think, on Twitter about it one of the times it happened mm. um, because it has happened so many times. She goes viral every few months for one reason or another. And the one time I tried to capitalize off that, I was like, well, I would love to have a <laughs> tweet go viral. Sure. Like, let me talk about Medusa. That's my thing. Right. Um, and I and I think I just made some snappy. <laughs> I don't know if that's the word I want to use, but comment about um, like, oh, people are just discovering that Medusa, you know, wasn't a monster. She was a badass ruined right. by Athena or like something, you know, it was something like that kind of calling out Athena and mm. and being very pro um, Medusa as a survivor. And I had somebody just try to go off on me about how I didn't understand Greek mythology because I was referencing Ovid. And I was like, well, I mean, oh one. I'm a Greek mythology podcast. And they were like, well, <laughs> Greek. And and I was like, well, yeah. I'm a Greek and Roman mythology podcast. Shut up. It's basically the same thing. Calm down. Like, yes, I understand the difference between Greece and Rome. Thank you. How Like, I, <laughs> my undergrad taught me at least that much. I may not be an academic, but that I know. Um, and, and so, you know, uh, it just kept going where I was like, I... I know the myth. Calm yeah. down. Like, I don't want to have this fight with you. I know what I'm talking about. And it ended up, I just quoted Hesiod to him. And he was like, what's that? And I'm like, oh, my fucking God. Like, you don't even, I can quote Hesiod to you and you're still not going. It's like he didn't, he barely knew who Hesiod was. So he was right. still trying to fight me on the internet as though he knew more. But couldn't even comment when I said he said I was like this is the first example of the story of Medusa and it says oh and I think I quoted the translation I quoted said Poseidon lay with her because it was a very old translation and so he was like well there's nothing there and I was like oh my god let's read every other word in that sentence and know that it is still (laughs) accurate and also nine times out of ten if a god lay with a woman it means he assaulted her that's yeah. how it went. <laughs> yeah, and and I think that's um that's kind of like nail on head, really, isn't it? Is that these? Uh, I was going to say these people, these men are so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they they're all men. But they're let's so say two. Men. Let's say these cisgendered men. I think almost yeah. exclusively. No, that, that's completely true. So th- yeah, like these these cis men uh, are incredibly willing to point out your perceived lack of expertise, but they almost invariably have absolutely none of their own. So. I mean, I wouldn't class myself as like a world expert on the Medusa myth, but I did dedicate like six years of my academic career to studying the myth. I've written a book based on the myth. I think it's probably accurate to say at this point that like I know the myth. And... Yeah, absolutely. I would I would say the same. <laughs> <laughs> and that the number of men who have like tried to pick really obvious holes in my argument naturally weird well not weirdly at all because it makes total sense but the exact example that I get every single time is yeah but it's Roman so it's 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 like it's a Roman myth so why are you saying um like, like it's a Greek myth and a usually I don't say that I'll say it's like a classical myth because I think you know it, it's a myth that is ultimately an accretion of all the various classical traditions the Ovid version absolutely there's uh, no point in nef- necessarily differentiating. Well, that yeah, was a point in the tweet yeah. that my my issue as well. I didn't use the word Greek in it. The guy came back to me because my Twitter handle said yeah, I was okay. a Greek podcast. And I was like, oh my God, get out of here. Why are you tackling this myth that isn't entirely 100% <laughs> Greek? Which in itself, as you will know, is very, very silly because even the myths that we now classify as like Greek myths – are not entirely Greek because they got their stories from somewhere. Like, do you know what I mean? Even the things Absolutely. that we think are entirely Greek are not. Well, and even, I mean, it, it, even the use of the word Greek, it, if you want to dig that deep into it, it's like, okay, well, Hesiod didn't live in Greece. So what do you want to call it then? Like, it, it, not, yeah, it's, you know, none of them lived in Greece. 
they didn't know that word. I don't know when the word started getting used, I'll admit. But at the same time, you know, I don't I don't remember where Hesiod was from, but he certainly wouldn't have called himself Greek. No. No, and and I think it, it's such a sort of um, like nitpicky thing to pick on anyway, but it doesn't help that it's also just like wrong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just no point in in if you're just talking about the myth of Medusa, pointing out that Ovid is Roman. No, it, it's like, well, yeah, I'm just talking about Medusa, though. Yeah. I, I didn't say I was talking about <laughs> any particular interpretation of Medusa. We're talking Medusa, sure. Ovid's Roman, yeah. Okay, yeah. he like, is. Like- <laughs> I'm not gonna deny that. <laughs> Like, what do they hope to achieve by by pointing out stuff like that? Oh, yeah. The other thing that a lot of men, sorry, cis men, will take umbrage with is they'll say, oh, but why are you making it into a feminist thing? Because Athena's the one that punishes her. And it's like, yes, that's because women can also be complicit in patriarchy. And also, if you really want to go there, I think it's very telling that the... I mean, A, she's not a woman, she's a goddess. But the goddess that punishes Medusa is Athena, who is perhaps the goddess most well known for being incredibly patriarchal. She's the deity, like the patron deity of a very patriarchal city-state. She has incredibly masculine attributes, both in, you know, what she wears, how she acts, um, the kind of spheres that she has influence over. So if you really want to go there, like, we can go there. But it's not as simple as this is not a good myth to use for feminist reception because a woman does a bad thing. Yeah, it's it's the same kind of argument that, that comes so often where it's like it, the idea that to be feminist, you have to support everything all women do. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, like the argument going on in the States right now about the potential new Supreme Court. It's like, well, she's a woman. It's like, yeah, but she's awful for women, though. Like, yeah. <laughs> that it doesn't change anything. Athena... Athena is always a goddess that I sort of work to wrap my head around because I find it very interesting, all those things you just said about her, because she was, she was the man's goddess. Yeah. She was the goddess of the patriarchy. She was the one who helped heroes and hurt women. And I think that we have those stories about her for all the same reasons, because, you know, she was the man's goddess and, and the men were the ones who passed down the stories or rewrote them enough that we still have them and so i mean i think athena's an enigma in that way i'm constantly kind of trying to understand what she would have been as a goddess if we were only talking to women of ancient greece i would love to understand that because i think i mean i want to think good things about her and i ultimately do when i just choose to understand her in that kind of way um but I mean, she's a fascinating character in herself. The episode I where I covered Medusa, um, I also covered Arachne. So it was sort of a two part. Okay, yeah. What the fuck is wrong with you, Athena? <laughs> episode, and I did go about Medusa's story in the way that you were talking about up front, sort of where, you know, Perseus is the villain in the way Ovid tells it. You know, it's pretty clearly like this woman was keeping to herself Hmm. trying not to hurt anybody because she turned them to stone and he came to her to to just take her head because he could use it you know um but i think i think athena like trying to understand athena is is so difficult for that reason but of course yeah i mean athena doesn't have to be a feminist icon just because she's a woman you know and and it's such a non-argument to suggest that that the story of medusa can't be reinterpreted um in in the through the lens of sort of modern feminism just because athena is the one who punishes her well yeah and and i think that i would make the argument probably that for all the reasons that you just specified it actually makes it a better vehicle for feminist interpretation because it's a good example of how women are complicit in patriarchy, like with the Supreme Court. Like you can use it as an example of how women can hurt women. And often, not all the time, because some women just, you know, just do bad things. And because we're like people with agency and personalities and we're not all the same. <laughs> but some the concept. I know, right? It's amazing. But uh, sometimes, as in the case of, I think personally, uh, the myth of Medusa you could ascribe it to internalized misogyny. Like I think the fact that Athena is sort of an embodiment of certain patriarchal values, I don't think is a coincidence that she 
is essentially, I would say, complicit in victim blaming Medusa. Like that, that is a phenomenon that this myth is very good to use as an example to discuss. Yeah, it's almost yeah, exactly. It makes it sort of a better a better way to to look at all of those issues. I also think it's interesting to consider um, Athena's actions being also based in she can't exactly go and punish Poseidon. So yeah. there is that interpretation that kind of floats around the internet, usually in the form of a Tumblr meme. I've Tumblr. found, yeah, it's it's always Tumblr that that Athena was protecting Medusa. Yeah. And I do I think that that's an interesting interpretation today. I don't think it's it's accurate to how it was understood then mm. because of all the things we laid out about Athena's character um and her as sort of yeah, a vehicle for many aspects of the the patriarchy, but it is a nice way of seeing it now where sure she was sort of keeping her keeping Medusa from being um from being hurt again by the gods because she couldn't exactly stop Poseidon he was a god far more powerful than her. I think it's an interesting way of looking at a, a lot of stories of the gods and their actions against women and when certain things like that come about. I mean, there's just so many ways to interpret Medusa and Athena and I personally could do it forever. I know, that's the thing. And, and I think that's what a lot of these cis men don't actually realize is that we're not saying this is the correct interpretation of the myth. We're just saying this is one of many valid interpretations. So maybe like get all the way off our back about it. Like just just stop. Absolutely. And and just like consider letting women have a thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like it's it's not like, you know, every other myth in the in the corpus of literature is like you know, misandrous drivel that just that hates men and and women have like have never given men a space in the field of myth. That's the opposite of what's happened. Like we're just carving out space in okay, we're not just this myth, but I think particularly this myth. And the fact that so many cis men have a problem with us just claiming like this tiny piece of ground, like th this paving slab on the continent of classical myth, is just so childish. It is. And it just kind of, yeah, it shows that it's, it's always still about power, even now of Absolutely. men having the power. It sort of, yeah, it just perpetuates the exact problem that we're sort of discussing when we try to reinterpret or just understand Medusa in a different way, or just sort of take her on as, as a sort of emblem of of women just trying to sort of claw back a bit of power or claw it out for the first time. Yeah, no, and, and exactly. And I don't think that it's a coincidence either. The, the reason I think men, or one of the reasons I should say, that uh, cis men do kind of get a bit, um, try to think of a, a nice way of putting it, but maybe I should just be mean. They get <laughs> like, it's like they're a little child and you've put them down for a nap and you said to them, look, I have work tomorrow. You have to sleep for like an hour and a half just so I can get some work done. And the kid is like, oh, what? You, you have to work, but why aren't I your priority? Like, that, that's not fair. And then the kid just starts screaming and like throwing his toys around. And ultimately, neither the nap nor the work gets done. And I kind of feel like having this argument all the time about this myth is, is just the same. Like... It's not productive. Um, but also, if we don't try and have that argument, then the only interpretation that anyone knows is Perseus kills a monster and that's a good thing because he's a hero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. And a good analogy, I would say. <laughs> Thank you. I, I love to have the fight, honestly. I'll keep having it. Like, when it comes up, I will have it. Because I also think... Oh, yeah. It, Personally, it took me a long time to get to the point where I felt like I had, I don't want to say authority, but essentially that's what I mean. But like the authority to feel like I had a, 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 just like a, an opinion to make, because I think mm. the internet does sort of suggest that you, you require a certain level of, uh, I don't even know what it really is, but it, it's so easy mm. to get attacked online that it took me a long time to yeah. to feel comfortable being like, no, I don't care. You can attack me on this. I, I 
am going to stand up for my opinion on it. Um, mm. And even when people do still come at me uh, about it specifically, I still question myself for a bit. I mean, I think there was one, I feel like the one maybe that, that led us to have to, to reach out to each other more directly right before going to bed on, like on the Pacific time zone, which always throws it because I've sort of seemed to live in this like bubble on this time zone. Um, right before going to bed, I just like made a quick response to somebody and woke up and it had like spiraled and exploded. It, essentially, I made a comment about Medusa and he tried to snip back of, oh, that's interesting. Yes, that's actually Ovid's version, blah, 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 as if he was helping. And I'm like, I fucking know it's Ovid's version. I- I'm still talking about yeah. it. I don't care. And I so I was like snippy back and I was like, yeah, I know the myth. I'm a Greek mythology podcast. I've been doing this for three years. Like, and mm-hmm. and then that turned into like this huge thread. And I woke up the next morning and people had defended me and he had <laughs> lost his mind and he'd acted like I had lost it and blocked me for being all unreasonable. And I was like, I responded with one tweet before going to sleep and minding my own business. I would have c- continued on. Like, I'm not saying that I wouldn't have done all those things, but I didn't do them. <laughs> I remember this. Yes, because we, we both got involved because, yeah, he... Um, I think you were in the right time oh zone to keep going and I had just gone to sleep. <laughs> I was. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that you like went to bed and then I kind of like picked up the sword and like defended <laughs> yeah. your honour and then... <laughs> And then it got really out of hand. And um, yeah, I, I ended up reaching out to quite a few of my like, um, fr- from when I was in academia, um, a few of my contacts, because actually kind of like you, I was sort of like, if he's going this hard at me, does is he right? Like, um, am I wrong? Right? You question everything. Yeah. And like, I, I was pretty sure that I, I was right. But I think as a woman, you're so conditioned to like not have faith in your own mm-hmm. ability or standing. So I ended up messaging um, a male professor that I, he worked at my uh, university before I uh, left my PhD program. And I actually, as an experiment, he agreed to make a tweet that was really similar to the tweet I'd made that this man was like, yeah, yeah it's just wrong. Mm-hmm. And this man made the tweet and like nothing happened. Like it wasn't controversial at all. But because me and you were the ones that were kind of saying it, it, it was perceived as being like like we were just these like woke feminists, like colonizing the field of myth. And it's like, no, we we just know our stuff and we're not afraid to say it. Well, exactly. And and I think this the argument that this um man was trying to make to me was as if oh, he wasn't correcting me. He was just pointing out a fact because Mm. most people don't know it was Ovid and not original Greek or whatever. And I just want to be like, it's just like, you can look at my, I mean, and maybe, you know, he didn't know who I was or, or looked, and not to say that I am somebody, but it's like, I have a very successful Greek mythology podcast if I'm just being straight about it. So I think that I have some kind of authority and, and I think that you can assume I don't need to have it pointed out that, oh, actually, that's all of it. And it's blah, blah, blah. And it's <laughs> it's nonsense to say, again, the original Greek. It's, it's a pointless it's a pointless thing to just correct somebody when you're not. It sounds like you're correcting them, but really not correcting them. You say you're just pointing something out as if they don't know. And it's oh. like, again, like I I know. And and it's, you know, it's the same with the, the guy who came at me before of, well, you say you're a Greek mythology podcast and you're using a Roman version. And I was like, well, the episode where I covered it all, I said that it was Ovid and it doesn't matter anyway. <laughs> like, yeah. it, it, it's not, it's not like I'm just going about telling people that this is the truth about the original so-called Greek and blah, blah, blah. Like, it, it, you know, it's, but it's always, it has to be, women have to be corrected. And then because yes. it has happened to us so often and we are so conditioned, then we question ourselves when we shouldn't. And, and then that, leads us to like the cycle to continue because we don't have the confidence to stand up for when we know we are right or the fact that we're allowed to have an opinion yeah no I I think that's completely it And, and I think that kind of like you actually in the in the past I might have been tempted to be like oh maybe this person is right and I'm wrong and, and I might have stepped back but now I'm just like do you know what this, this this is a fight that I am very confident that I can stand my ground so I'm gonna just stand it and if and if you want to vent at me on Twitter for like four hours about it then 
you know, th- that's up to you. And I'll, I'll argue with you as long as I feel like we can have some kind of discussion before you start inevitably just being a misogynist because that's usually how it ends up let's be honest yeah it's just like it is <laughs> just unbridled misogyny and at that point it's kind of like okay well this is clearly about more than the myth i'm not really here to be like called a bitch online i mean it's it doesn't offend me but it's just like okay well i'm just like i've had that enough that's dumb yeah it's unhelpful it's not there's no point in continuing on when it's devolved into that no no, not at all like i'm perfectly willing to have a kind of like structured debate about it or to get into the kind of nitty-gritty of the myth that's fine but i'm not here to like defend my existence as a like a female classicist or be as a woman like I'm, I'm not here for that I'm, I have things to do I have a job I have I have a cat to feed like I have, <laughs> I have stuff going on it's part of the a same issue where you know you you often have to feel like you have some kind of backing to it like mm-hmm. you went through all those years of your PhD and so you have that and I have my podcast but at the same time it's like we could be still be fully right in Mm. that and not have to have that but because of the way it is you know and because of the patriarchy we still very much live in we Mm. feel like we have to have those things to back us up it just adds to the the silliness and the just the ridiculousness that comes with being a woman on the internet (laughs) no completely and and actually yeah that is a really good point in that at the end of the day, we shouldn't have to keep on like trotting out our various qualifications and experiences just to have our opinions kind of treated on the same level as some random fucko on twitter.net. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, like Steve 309 (laughs) on Twitter and his bio is like, love Leicester football club. And he thinks his opinion is, is a hundred percent valid. And then we have to be there like, yes, but also I studied this for like half my life. And if we don't say that, then our opinion isn't as valid as like Leicester City fan. Absolutely. And then it tends to be that that doesn't work anyways. No, not at all. So, you know, because because men don't feel like they have to have that, you know, it's just like, no, I'm right because I feel like I know this. And it's it's just, I mean, yeah, it's an ongoing problem of everything to do with it, how it is to be, um, you know, a woman or certainly anyone falling outside of the binary as well. I I do want to say I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to link this to just cisgendered women. Definitely not. It's sort of being used as a catch-all term for everyone who's not a a (laughs) cis man in the moment. (laughs) It's basically like women and people of all marginalized genders, because actually the guy that we were talking about before, uh, when I reached out to some of my like academic pals and I kind of said like, does anybody here know this guy? Because he's he's being awful. And I think about four or five people messaged me and they said like, yeah, I, I've had beef with this guy. He he has form. And most of them were women, but there was also um, a couple of non-binary people who said, yeah, he, he's come onto my thread before and like mm. either derailed it or just made either made a comment that I've already made, but kind of tried to frame it like he's adding something new. Which is exactly what he did to me. Yeah, yeah exactly, it's like as yeah. if he needs to correct or add something new. It's, yeah. No, it's infuriating. So, yeah. Like, yeah. So, caveat necessary, it doesn't just affect women, and especially not just cis women. But, it, yeah, it, it's kind of a, an unfortunate catch all term here, I think. Yeah, it, it's, I think it just, to be clear that we are, are certainly not, not trying to single out cis women here um we are singling out cis men i will say oh we are definitely singling out cis men as the problem Mm -hmm. um (laughs) but not anyone else as as sort of the subject of the problem no yeah it it is inevitably cis men like it it just is and it is we all yeah usually white ones let's be clear too like almost exclusively white ones yeah i mean the only reason that i i can't say that for for definite is is purely because i don't know what a lot of them like I, that's I, true. I've only ever seen their profile picture, which is like a, an anime thing. Like I, I don't know, but I, I have a yeah. suspicion they probably are almost all white because that's yeah. No, definitely that's true. I'm not actually saying I know for sure. I just uh, I think I know the vibe. <laughs> yeah, it's not exactly. It's it's a very specific vibe that you do pick up on, and you you really can tell. Like you just can. Yeah, it's that 
privileged, I don't have to worry about anything in the world vibe. And that is almost exclusively cisgendered white men. Yeah, like my opinion has historically always been valued above everyone else's. I've always been considered to be right, no matter what the context. And yeah, it's it's a white cis guy, okay? It just is. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) yeah, exactly. We know them well. We do, unfortunately, Yeah. yeah. So why don't you tell everyone um, where they can find you and perhaps find your book? Okay, um, well, you can find my book on Amazon or Lulu. It's called Hear the World Entire. Uh, You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Kyatic, which is K-Y-A-T-I-C. I don't know why I called it that. It's it's a bit silly, really, because no one could pronounce it, but that's fine. I actually quite like it. You're you're playing on chaotic. Yeah, your name. Well, exactly. I've always no, I've always appreciated it. Oh, well, thank you so much. Because I've had everyone be like, "What does that mean?" I'm like, I guess it's kind of chaotic, but I don't know. Uh, you can also find me on uh, Tumblr. I have a blog called Mythology Mondays where I retell various myths with lots of swear words. As everyone who's listening to this knows, I do love retellings of myths with lots of swear words. Oh, well, then you will like my blog. <laughs> it is literally all I do every single week of this podcast. So <laughs> well, myths lend themselves very well to being retold with lots of swear words. Like it, it's exactly. just very, it, it fits. It, 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 it does. I mean, they are crazy. Yeah. And that's why I love them so much. You have to say how fucking ridiculous this <laughs> is all the time. And Poseidon, I should say. Poseidon Ugh. does not get enough credit for being right? fucking awful. No, like, can we, like, very briefly just talk about the Twitter poll that I did, which had the exact wrong answer win, by the way? Because I. Yes, I know. <laughs> and all my listeners were doing it too. And it's totally my fault because I harp on Zeus all the time because the problem with determining who is the worst man in, mm. in sort of the Olympian gods is that Zeus. <sighs> Zeus's stories of his assault of women are the more famous ones. Yeah. And so they're the ones that people know. But if you are digging, digging, digging into mythology, you know that Poseidon is arguably worse. It's just that he just assaults everyone and their stories didn't get famous. <laughs> yeah, that's literally it. Like, especially if you read, um, I mean, in, in particular, Metamorphoses, a lot of the mm. rape narratives in that, uh, in Metamorphoses, which specifically I think work as analogies for trauma, Poseidon is the rapist. Like he- I find him, he's more menacing. Yeah. Like, he's the one I would be more afraid of. He's awful. I mean, he's the one, like, obviously Rape Medusa. And then there's also the myth of, I'm going to pronounce her name wrong, but Canis, who uh, he rapes, and then she's so traumatized that she asks to be turned into a man, like you know that's yeah that's like not a thing uh no and a mimini i don't know if that's in ovid but he yeah he's he he rapes a mimini and then to make it up to her he shows her where a spring is oh well it's, he's like well he not have water <laughs> oh my god <laughs> that's awful yeah he's a messy and and not even necessarily all in his assault as well like actually the um episode i'm releasing uh this week so it'll be out for a couple weeks by the time this episode we're recording now comes out but um i covered the serial killers that theseus encounters uh on his way to athens Mm -hmm. um they are almost exclusively sons of poseidon (laughs) these are these are men who tie strangers to two different pine trees let them spring back and be torn in half and people who ask somebody to clean their feet and then kick them off a cliff (laughs) or (laughs) to uh, secure or force somebody to fit a certain bed size by cutting off their limbs or stretching them and and they're all sons of Poseidon. And it, it's fascinating to me that he was associated with quite so many horrific things. Like, not even from just a, a woman's perspective, but straight up, like, no, he was, he had some horrifying people involved with him. <laughs> yeah, that's not a coincidence, I feel. <laughs> no, one of the things I remember most from my mythology course in my undergrad is I had this great prof she was a very eccentric and lovely woman and um 
I explicitly remember her talking about how bad Poseidon was and how his son Triton was even worse. And I've actually yet to find a lot of examples for Triton being horrible. Mm. Um, But I still remember her saying it. And I'm like, I just want to know exactly kind of what she was implying back then. Because I mean, I I can only imagine given everything else I know about Poseidon. Yeah, I mean, I I think that he's he's just the worst, I think is is really all that can be said about Poseidon. He's terrible. uh, And I hate him. Like I I just Yeah. If I'm gonna be afraid of one of the gods, it's Poseidon over Zeus. Like I feel like Zeus, every time he goes and assaults a woman, it's one of those horrible and very real instances of the man doesn't think he's assaulting a woman. Yeah. Um, and he is, but with Poseidon, it's like, no, no, he sets out to do that. Yeah, I think the intent is very much there with Poseidon. Exactly. Like he wants to go assault women and Zeus wants to have sex with women and he just almost never has their consent no i think that he just doesn't understand like the paradigm of consent whereas poseidon's like oh you you said no well i'm gonna do it anyway yeah exactly like oh he's just so much more violent too he's just yeah no poseidon is the worst i would argue he is and everyone that said that zeus was worse than poseidon in my poll i'm sorry you were wrong (laughs) yep did anyone else say poseidon um yeah like i think the overall like result it was something like because I, I had um Zeus Poseidon uh Dionysus and Apollo is like the the four people and it was kind of like which Greek god would get cancelled on Twitter first and nearly everyone I think something like nearly 70 percent said Zeus and then a kind of like rough 10 percent was sort of allocated to each of the other three and I was just like guys you're, you're so wrong like it it would be Poseidon because Zeus would get away with it like Harvey Weinstein for like decades oh it's so true poseidon would look at zeus and be like oh he's getting away with it i probably can too but poseidon would go so far so fast that it would just be all over the news and he would be cancelled within like two days yeah no that's very true no i definitely put in a vote for poseidon absolutely yeah so i appreciate both of my accounts i was like i'm gonna try to force this (laughs) (laughs) yeah they can go the right way yeah exactly well, thank you so much for talking with me today. This has been so much fun. Um, I'm very excited or very happy that we uh, thought to do this after all of our many <laughs> encounters about Medusa, yeah. where we're sort of often commiserating with each other and then that turned into DMs <laughs> commiserating with each other. I know. It's, it's good to think that it all came of men being awful. Ugh, nerds. Thank you all for listening to that. I could, we could talk Medusa for hours, um, but we did stop ourselves. But I hope, but I hope you've also listened to this week's regular episode, which is more on that woman, specifically from the perspective of debunking nonsensical reply guys on Twitter, but also on looking at sort of every different interpretation and version of her from antiquity, which is fascinating. Medusa was a fucking badass character, monster, woman, gorgon, whatever she was, she was fucking awesome. I am Liv and I love this shit.